So good good evening. Can you hear me? Um, so we've reached the we've reached the final uh, um, uh, part of our programming for today before we go to dinner. Um, I'm very happy to welcome you all um, to our plenary panel titled um, Feminist Critique, Pedagogy and Scholarship in Times of Crisis. Um, I'm Sara Murad, Assistant Professor of Media Studies um, here at AUB. Um, before I introduce my speakers, uh, let me just briefly explain the format of this session. So we've imagined this to be a more, um, a less structured, uh, um, or more or less structured conversation about feminist critique, so about feminist scholarship and pedagogy. Um, and so we'll be uh, focusing the discussion um, around three main axes. So we'll start with um, the historical and political context um, of, of economic and social crises and of feminist organizing in the past and the present. We'll then move on to a more focused discussion on scholarship, um, knowledge, feminist knowledge production in the region or about the region. Um, and then finally, we will end with um, a discussion on pedagogy, so the importance of gender and women's studies curricula, of teaching gender in the classroom, and of um, feminist pedagogy and, and how we imagine it to be. So I will start by introducing um, our speakers. Um, professor Beth Barron is a distinguished professor of history at the City College and Graduate Center of the City University of New York, where she is also the director of the Middle East and Middle Eastern American Center at the CUNY Graduate Program, sorry, Graduate Center. From 2009 to 2014, she edited the International Journal of Middle East Studies, and from 2015 and 2017, she served as the president of the Middle East Studies Association of North America. Her most recent book, The Orphan Scandal, Christian Missionaries and the Rise of the Muslim Brotherhood, appeared with Stanford University Press in 2014. Earlier works include Egypt as a Woman, Nationalism, Gender, and Politics, and The Women's Awakening in Egypt, Culture, Society, and the Press. Our second speaker, Professor Francis Hasso, is an Associate Professor in Gender, Sexuality, and Feminist Studies at Duke University, with secondary appointments in the Department of Sociology and the Department of History. She is an editor of the Journal of Middle East Women's Studies, um, and her scholarship focuses on the intersections between transnational dynamics, states, and social movements, and practices in the Arab world. In 2016, she published with Zakia Salim, Freedom Without Permission, Bodies and Space in the Arab Revolutions, published by Duke University Press. Other recent publications include Civil and the Limits, of Politics and Revolutionary Egypt. Um, and she's also the author of Consuming Desires, Family Crisis, and the State in the Middle East, published by Stanford University Press. Um, and Resistance, Repression, and Gender Politics in Occupied Palestine and Jordan, published by Syracuse University Press. And last but not least, uh, Islah Jad. Islah is an associate professor um, at Birzeit University, currently linked to Qatar University's International Affairs Department. So she's been um, um, affiliated with them since 2014. Uh, Jad is a lecturer on gender issues and politics at the Women's Studies Institute and Cultural Studies Institute of Birzeit University, where she was its director from 2008 till 2013. She is also a founding member of the Women's Studies MA program. She has written books and papers on the role of women in politics, Palestinian women and the relationship among them, Islam, and of course, NGOs. Dr. Jad is also a consultant on gender issues uh, to the United Nations Development Program and is a co-author of the UN's Arab Development Report on Women's Empowerment. She also has authored two books, Palestinian Female-Headed Households, and Women at the Crossroads, the Palestinian Women's Movement Between Nationalism, Secularism, and Islamism. So um, join me in welcoming our um, speakers for this panel. Uh, 
Um, yes. So okay. <laughs> so um, so <laughs> as as I uh, um, mentioned, um, this is going to be more or less a conversation, and obviously it's going to be open for a Q and A session um, afterwards. So I want to start with uh, by focusing on the political and historical context and to try to think about the current economic and political and social crises in our region, um, how we can think about them through a feminist lens. Um, and what can feminist thinking, uh, how can it help us understand, analyze these crises, but also, um, you know, beyond the diagnostic function also maybe uh, prescribe ways out or solutions to um, what we may see as crises today. So um, do you want me to use that? Um, sure. <coughs> yes, we have two mics only. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we, we got an assignment from Sarah and we all did our best, you know, and because it's a conversation, but it hasn't actually it will together. So what I thought I would do is I just wrote down a few notes on this question. And I guess I didn't work with the concept of crisis. Mm -hmm. So uh, just because, you know, there's some discussion about the usefulness of a term like crisis. And I don't think that feminism is in particular crisis, although we're in the latest wave of, you know, world crisis. Um, so I guess as a feminist scholar, I would say for, and a, and a political activist, uh, and actually I'm a scholar of social movements, so I've thought about this a lot. So I see feminist thought as useful for unpacking, you know, some of these dynamics, but only if feminism is understood as a way of thinking about the world rather than fundamentally lodged in particular embodiments, identities, and categories. So while embodied positionalities are crucial, and I've written about embodied positionalities, the trick really is to understand and acknowledge them while not becoming bogged down uh, in them. And I think it really is a trick because bodies do matter. And then, but, you know, yeah, there is a way of naturalizing them. Uh, and that's, that's, that's a big part of feminist critique. Feminist approaches ultimately, I think, should challenge ideological naturalizations of inequality, and they're very useful in that way. And they help us think about challenging either or uh, frameworks and maybe uniform understandings of desire. And so people really do want different things, which has historically posed obstacles in all the movements I've been involved in and all the movements I've studied for organizing of every kind, right? So, so that's, I think, something we don't quite have a handle on, is what to do with different kinds of desires and aspirations. I increasingly recognize, moreover, that not all the things we care about at the level of politics writ large or the sociality and politics of everyday life occur at conscious and intentional levels. And part of this has to do with being at Duke for seven or eight years where psychoanalytic theory is big. And, uh, and I keep, uh, yeah, a measured uh, response to that kind of uh, concern. But it has made me realize that it would be interesting if we considered more not just the level of intentionality, but also the other kinds of levels that are at work in politics. And I don't have easy answers for how we address these anxieties and desires, either as global citizens or feminists. And I guess I recognize also as an activist uh, more than a teacher or a researcher that politics is by definition reductive. And I think that's actually a very nice thing to recognize, that it's not the same as theory, although every politics is structured by theoretical assumptions. I always tell my students whether you know it or not or acknowledge it or not. But for me, uh, you know, politics is about holding certain complexities and differences in tension in tension, almost bracketing them sometimes in order to accomplish certain things that a group 
a group of people or a group of groups prioritize. And I guess, you know, what I've also thought about for a long time is can we have a politics that organizes around a core set of principles but is all right with differences and also comfortable with temporality, which we're not really comfortable with temporality, but where the end of a group or coalition is not the end but the beginning of something else. That that's, almost, that's not failure but actually a dynamic process of organizing. And I guess the last point I'd make for that first question, something I've been thinking about a lot, is I think we need a better understanding of men's anxieties in relation to each other in the region and their competition and their um, and, and elsewhere in feminist activism. How does attention to masculinities help us understand the so-called public matters of predatory capitalism, settler colonialism, imperialism, authoritarianism, Sectarianism, sectarianism, fundamentalism, and war. Um, I think about this all the time, and I think we often, feminist scholars in the region, often I've written about this a little bit in some of my work, is that we too much still see it as sort of men against women, and what would happen if we actually started to um, see, like basically relations of patriarchy are routine, routinely positioned as the primary axis, like men against women, but what happens to our theories and our activism if we assume that states consider men the primary sources of sexual and political unruliness, and thus they're the primary focus of repression and control. I mean, how do we do that and talk about personal status laws, and you see what I mean? All these other things, sexual assault, and things like that. Those are my comments. Um, so I think an interesting or important point you made here at the end is to, to rephrase it maybe a little bit of gen, gender does not equal women, right? Mm -hmm. If we are to apply a gender analytics to understand society, then we must surely grapple with questions of masculinity as well. Um, so, Beth, do you want to go next? Yeah. So, I'm actually going to give you this. And then that way. OK. okay. Um, first, I wanted to, to thank the organizers and thank all of you for coming, um, particularly at the end of a, a very um, packed uh, and exciting intellectually exciting day. Um, but just thank you for, the, for giving me the opportunity to come and listen and learn. And essentially, that's, that's, uh, I, I've learned a lot. I've learned one thing that we may have to go home and change the name of our Middle East Center to, to something else. <laughs> um, that's the first thing. Um, I, I also, w when, when I've seen the, the set of questions you gave and the title of the conference, I, I, I began to think about feminism and crisis in different registers. So it sort of set off different. Um, but in two initially, but then Hoda added to, uh, a third to that. One is the crisis of feminism itself. Another, as Hoda says, is feminism in crisis mode. Um, but feminism at a time of crisis uh, was the way that, that, that I was thinking about it. Perhaps I was thinking about that because um, in the United States, we often just think of the Middle East as a place of crisis. And I, I began to think about why was I thinking, that, formulating it in that register. Um, one of the crises, I guess, that we haven't talked about so much, but, but to me is so ever-present, is the, the crisis of the environment. And I think that that's something that um, feminism here and everywhere has a huge potential to contribute to um, and to, to um, help face. Because at the end of the day, um, that, that may be the big one. Um, authoritarian states and other issues are certainly tough ones, but that's that's one when we come to the issues of the global, I think that we, we can we can talk about. Um, but I, I, what I wanted to do in my couple of minutes here is actually talk a little bit about the diaspora, uh, diaspora women, and bring them into the conversation, and particularly around the issue of the Muslim ban, which I think relates to some of the issues that um, that we're getting at in our discussion of scholarship and pedagogy and politics, um, because I come from a place that's in crisis at the moment. Um, yeah, it's usually the one looked out to the Middle East as a place of crisis, but uh, the US is not uh, very hospitable at the moment. Um, and w one of the things one's one seen with the Muslim ban, um, and there's been three iterations uh, of the ban, 
that uh, the president um, put out against different countries and, and the legislation or, or the regulation has changed over time about which different countries are being blocked and so on, is that um, women and men and activists in great numbers stepped up to fight the ban. And there is a feminist dimension to this whole, to the whole um, Muslim ban. And one of the things that really has struck me, um, Mesa, uh, Mesa became a signatory to the, um, to the, um, not a signatory, Mesa is a plaintiff in the case against the Muslim ban uh, in the courts. So we're actually uh, represented by ACLU in the court. So we followed the case very closely. And one of the things you realized when you, when you followed the case through the courts, when it got from the, um, the district level to the circuit level, it was, it was heard by a huge panel of judges. And those judges, when they were um, voting on whether the ban would be upheld or not, split um, split down uh, gender lines and um, ethnic lines. So it's simply like they simply lined up in um, uh, almost as one would have predicted, but it really was uh, as one predicted. So at the end of the day, um, empowering women, it seems to me, means to be empowering women to become judges, to become politicians, to become, to, to be decision makers, so that, so that actually at the end of the day one can fight these sorts of things like the Muslim ban. And the Muslim ban becomes crucial to the kind of scholarship that we're trying to do and the teaching we try to do because it's really trying to block interchange of uh, the, the free flow of knowledge back and forth. It's bl blocking scholars and students coming from the Middle East to the United States. Um, and it's stigmatizing uh, Muslims and it's stig stigmatizing Middle Easterners and it's stigmatizing Muslim women in particular. Um, it's also actually been part of a change in the conversation as it's ra further racialized uh, Muslims and Arabs in the United States, which is, I think, part of the conversations that we've begun here today. Um, just to, to comment on, on something you've mentioned about the title of the conference. So when we, when we picked the title, it was intended with the two meanings. Um, the question of whether or not feminism is in crisis, whether here in, in, in Lebanon or in the region or even globally. Um, and especially as we consider the um, increasing interest of the state in pushing for women's rights agendas, especially here in the region. So the sense of which was addressed by um, um, in Huda's keynote, um, you know, do you collaborate or are you going to be co-opted? Um, and this tension that emerges for feminist activists, but also for feminist scholars and for those who think about feminism. So that was on one hand. On the other hand, um, feminism in crisis precisely is, you know, what can feminism do when you are dealing with crises, whether they are environmental or economic or crises of governance um, um, and political crises more generally. So it was indeed intended as a question to be asked on these two different um, dimensions. So, Islah, do you want to Okay, comment? thank you. Uh, I will agree with, with the title in the sense uh, that, yes, it's uh, feminism in, feminisms in crisis. And why is that? Be let me define crisis. Mm. Crisis, it's when you cannot go back to your old, you know, uh, basis of legitimacy. And when you are in a situation that you cannot go forward. So in this sense, I will try to explain, you know, why I agree with you. Uh, when we talk about feminism, we of definitely we, we don't talk about one thing, hmm? because we have different versions of feminism, as you know, uh, they have been evolved, historically speaking, uh, whether it is, you know, liberal feminism, uh, radical feminism, uh, cultural feminism, uh, social feminism, etc. So I will put the definition of uh, feminism that I adhere to, mm -hmm. and that's why I. When we talk about uh, 
feminism means is it is a hotly de contested debate in the 21st century. The term itself is so widely contested here and you know uh, from where uh, it came from and uh, derided that many people adamantly state that they are not feminist. As we see a lot of younger generations in our region that you do, the women think we are not, you know, uh, feminist. Uh, uh, as I said, especially among younger generation in our area, despite espousing what many consider feminist values and views. So what is feminism really uh, uh, about? For me, it's, well, it's maybe we can start by the notion of equality or social justice, not just for women, as uh, Francis mentioned, but for all people, uh, regard, regardless of gender, sexuality, race, culture, religion, ability, class, nationality, marital status. And I added marital status basically to touch upon the growing, you know, uh, social group in our area, which the, uh, when we talk about celibacy, uh, uh, and also uh, health or age. So uh, in this respect, we are not talking about women. Actually, we are talking about the dismantlement of a whole order, political, social, uh, cultural, economic, that generates discrimination. And that generates, you know, uh, uh, power and power hierarchy. So taking this, uh, uh, the, or starting from this uh, de definition, uh, we cannot then talk about one feminism, but of many. Uh, and the, the, the sum I put here, we can talk about careerist feminism, we saw it everywhere. I was hesitant to, co to call them feminist because they can be uh, careerist women. Uh, we can talk about a reformist feminist. Uh, Hoda mentioned this in her talk. I mean, uh, those who are working for change within the existing social order. They are not seeking to dismantle the existing social order, but seeking to reform it. Uh, Islamic feminist, as uh, we, it was mentioned, and we can, of course, talk about colonial feminist. Colonial feminists in our region were integral part of the Iraq invasion uh, of uh, Libya. Uh, I mean, you have a group of women who were in agreement with the uh, new wave of uh, colonial, colonial uh, and occupation, colonial power and occupation, that they ad adhere to the values brought uh, to the region by this uh, imperial uh, power. They work for their service and they repeat their values and they are see they are using or benefiting from the discourse of uh, uh, empower, women's empowerment and women in the decision-making uh, bodies. As such, we can see that Paul Bremer, and of course, Nadia will talk about uh, this much better than me, it was a condition in the Iraqi constitution to have 25% of women represented as a quota in the new uh, Iraq. And I will talk about this new woman uh, later on. Uh, why I, I, I put this? Because we, we see some kind of very uh, weird way in the sense that we might see that there is some violation of our rights, abortion, uh, legal reform, family law, etc. but we don't have the same sensitivity when it comes to the terrible violation of political rights or civil rights, as if they are in a different planet. They are not part of us, you know? They are different. So if we take or if we adhere to the notion uh, of feminism that 
takes as a starting point two soutien, or uh, all is interlinked or intersectionality. So we have to be very sensitive about any violation of right. I can put here many examples. Uh, you know, uh, uh, many feminists in Palestine, they did not blink an eye against the besieging and impoverished and destroyed Gaza. Gazans are not part of us. You know, this is the uh, process of creating the new uh, woman that, uh, you know, sees her rights in a bubble that is isolated from what is going on uh, around. So, however, we all, whether yani, are colonial or, you know, uh, I mean, whether we are uh, reformist or ra radical, or it, it, we are still seen by many males and females in the media, for example, in the classroom uh, and in talk shows, terrible sexist language, you know, in all uh, or most of talk shows we see uh, in the media uh, that see that uh, uh, I mean that the, the feminism people hear about are coming from sexist patriarchal mass media. If they want to be feminist friendly, they understand it as gender equality or equal pay. This is the, the best. Uh, uh, for equal work, sharing household chores, and parenting irrespective of the oppressive context and systems uh, of power. I, I, you, as, as we see in, in, in the last few days, the parenting law or the, you know, the, the, the male, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 parent, the parent, uh, vacation for, for males to, uh, to be with, with, with their women for two days. Uh, and this comes in a structure, uh, or a political system that is based on sectarianism that discriminates against every different, you know, uh, uh, groups or diff every different, uh, community. So we can have both in the same time. Uh, so to unpack this uh, uh, situation, we can see that, as Huda mentioned in the morning, that historically speaking, national movements and the struggle for national liberation was not harmful for women. And I am seeing this because we keep hearing, you know, over and again about the Algerian uh, syndrome, that women participated in the national struggle, but then they were pushed away, you know, later on. Studying the Palestinian situation, it is not true. It's not true in Palestine, and it's not true in Algeria. Look at the, the law that uh, uh, um, illegalized, for example, uh, domestic violence or rape. We can see that in the forefront for advocating for the legal reform, the mujahidat, it means that they still have power. They have legitimacy. And this is exactly my point, that by involving, you know, by women's involvement in the national liberation movements and anti-colonial uh, struggle, they benefited a lot. They benefited how to get together, how to be uh, uh, collectively, you know, uh, or develop uh, a collective agency, uh, and they gain very important societal uh, legitimacy. And I will put two lines under uh, legitimacy because we can do activism in different forms of movement and we might not succeed to gain the same uh, level or the same kind of uh, legitimacy. So, <clears throat> Why I am, uh, you know, highlighting this point? Because fighting colonialism and, you know, uh, was uh, uh, um, like a rallying cry. Now, when we are witnessing a more aggressive, more violent, that target civilians, you know, as part of the, the war techniques, why we don't have the same reaction women had at the beginning of the uh, 
uh, colonial wave in uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the beginning, the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th uh, century. Is, is it, does it have something to do with the kind of organization we have, the kind of discourse we, we have? Is it because we are too fragmented? Is it because we are very irrelevant? Or is it because we fail, you know, to build alliances with others to form a kind of power that uh, help in stopping or rebuffing or resisting the uh, current wave uh, of uh, wars and aggressions and uh, a tremendous level of violence in the region. Why I'm starting by this? Because it is everywhere around us. Israel launched since 1948, you know, more than, more than I think 12 wars against Lebanon, against Palestinians, you know, uh, direct wars or by proxy uh, wars in all the region. Beside, of course, <clears throat> the uh, current, uh, the current uh, direct uh, American um, uh, militarism and occupation of different parts uh, of the Arab world. So we are talking about massive skills, massive skills of violations, if I put it in the right, you know, discourse, we are massive skills of violation of all sorts of rights. And the war is about controlling our resources and controlling our will in the region. So in, with this situation, how can we perceive or theorize uh, the state? Uh, and are we still talking about post-independence uh, uh, state or we are witnessing uh, different uh, forms that is emerging? Uh, especially uh, starting from uh, late 70s uh, after the, 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 the end of, or the, the decaying or the weakening of pan-Arabism and these high hopes that mobilize millions of, uh, of men and women in our region uh, looking for a better uh, future and uh, building uh, the nation and building the new woman in this uh, nation. So uh, wars and conflicts and, and uh, uh, post-colonial uh, states uh, uh, right now, we can, uh, maybe I can use the, the term, a colleague of mine used it in her writings, the Rima Hamami, the term of uh, earned sovereignty. You get some power if you deliver. If you deliver what the imperial power wants. We see this in Egypt, we see this in Syria, we, the, we see this in Lebanon, yeah, and it, still, it took the, the form of kidnapping the prime, min, <laughs> the prime minister. We see, the, we, see, we see that everywhere. Consequently, this power hierarchy created by this massive uh, aggression uh, on the region uh, created uh, a form of state that, stem, that the legitimacy for the state coming from the coercive power they use, the, the, the total, the physical, you know, uh, 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 unprecedented level of violence against uh, the people. And we might see the emerging of what could be also termed uh, earned citizenship. You obey, you become a citizen. You don't obey, you have no uh, you know, rights of whatsoever. And we are seeing this in Emirates, in the Gulf, and now in, in Egypt. I mean the withholding of the passports of the citizens in this uh, area. So how this affected socially, economically, 
uh, uh, you know, uh, our lives and the, the different kinds of, 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 of battles we have to, uh, to in, engage ourselves in, of course, we see a high, very high level of unemployment, especially among the highly educated women, very high level of poverty, very high level of uh, all sorts of, uh, of violence. We see, uh, as it was mentioned this morning, early uh, marriage in, in Syria, in Yemen, in selling women, selling women. Uh, I mean all forms of incredible, incredible, something we can never imagine at the beginning of the 20th century. We are witnessing this and what is our reaction uh, as a feminist to this, you know, uh, degradation of uh, and the reducing of our lives to, uh, to value almost nothing, I think it is very many. I stop here and then. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Islah. I think, I mean, it's clear that we, you all agree that to think about feminism is beyond thinking about women. Think, you know, feminism as an analytic, as a way to think about the world more broadly, about, um, you know, you've mentioned envi the environment, um, um, geopolitics, the state of ongoing warfare that we were witnessing even a way to understand the immigration crises and the border politics that we're witnessing today. So, in other words, thinking of the subject of feminism beyond women specifically, which I think is often a, a, a misconception um, in terms of, of, you know, common understanding of what feminist critique, who the subject of feminist critique is and what it is meant to do. Um, and obviously we're dealing with, I mean, you're, you've mentioned um, Israeli wars, we're dealing in the region with, um, you know, so many different kinds of warfare, um, states waging wars on their own people, um, um, you know, whether it's in, in uh, uh, Syria, whether it's in uh, Yemen today, um, wars between Arab countries. So, and this was definitely something that we've thought about as we considered, you know, if we're thinking about power hierarchies and inequalities, how do wars, how does displacement, um, you know, impact existing power hierarchies and inequalities as well? Um, and here I want to perhaps shift the focus a little bit on the kind of scholarship that's been produced within what we may refer to as the field of Middle East women's studies. Um, and so thinking about the theoretical frameworks that have shaped um, um, the way we've come to think about gender in the region, um, also thinking about how we've come to define the region as a region, um, but also some of the key debates maybe and contentions among feminist scholars um, who have worked on the region. So, Francis, can you, can you start us off? Sure. So, um, I also wrote notes in response to Beth and Slah, but I think we're all on the, yeah, the same, the same page and that sort of thinking bigger. Um, but also trying to accomplish certain practical things. So in terms of, do um, you want me to speak louder? Yeah, sorry. I'm so used to speaking low. Uh, I may be paranoia, but um, I, I am in a panel, so I, I'll speak loudly. Um, so, so I guess for the scholarship question here, I speak as a fundamentally interdisciplinary feminist scholarship, which I think is, is very important to me, and an editor of the Journal of Middle East Women's Studies. And here I just thought I'd borrow from some of my own comments, which I, I cut, um, at a thematic roundtable I organized at the last Middle East Studies Association meeting. Um, I'd, I'd say that the subfield, and I don't think the subfield of gender and sexuality studies is really radically different in this way um, from other fields of study, uh, is, is dominated by overly narrow disciplinary paths that have an impact on the questions we ask and how we answer them methodologically and the theories that we 
engage. I, and I guess the goal, in my opinion, I, 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 I titled my talk something about non-tribal approaches to gender and sexuality. So the goal, in my opinion, should be non-tribal questions and approaches. And by which I mean first more that I think it would be good if we had more syncretic engagement to and with theory which I have this definition of theory uh, that I use. I think of theory as a concentrated form of explanation, right, which is important. Like, what is theory? It's a concentrated form of explanation, and it's developed by particular scholars in a particular historical moment and a particular context. I mean, I do this to demystify, like, what's theory? It's not something that other people, yes, other people, we all do it and can do it. So theory, therefore, is continuously in the making and moving. So I love theory, so I want to say that, too. Um, it's continuously in the making and moving as we deploy it and find our own voice and argument in any given piece of work. That's what I try to do in formative editing with, with us. Uh, scholars. This contrasts, I think, with faddish kinds of obsessions with particular texts or terms that may be of little relevance to the question you want to address or the context of that question or your object of analysis. Um, all of us, I think, have a responsibility to break conceptual and theoretical ground in Middle East gender and sexuality studies, and we need it. We need more of it. And to do so always by finding our voices and sustaining our arguments. And in that way, it's no different than any other scholarly endeavor. It's hard work. It's not easier. It's harder. I mean, it's hard, and then if you're interdisciplinary and you're thinking in these multi dimensional ways, okay, it's even harder. So uh, not, to, not to discourage you, but I think it's, it's important to recognize that it's serious, uh, serious uh, scholarship and serious work in the academy as well. I, I think a syncretic approach, moreover, in my opinion, takes seriously and together regional and local forms of explanation, if you think of theory as explanation, with explanations developed in other settings on similar questions. So the so-called local and regional, of course we know this, but it's good to remember it. They're anyway structured always by human migration, by wars, by capitalism, by extraction, by racialization, by sexism, and transnational systems of knowledge production, which are everywhere and often mystified. It's not like you can go to, I don't know, Know, Oslo and uh, I, I don't know like Oslo is one space where you do scholarship and Beirut is another we're well beyond those kinds of ways of thinking about knowledge systems and I think it's important to keep that in mind let us not forget as well that the ideological and material interests of empires colonizers and states they're always been t built into all academic and knowledge institutions and I thought of this earlier I thought of this earlier in a panel earlier, which uh, talked about Sarah Ahmed's uh, uh, Sarah Ahmed's scholarship and her uh, like recent book, Living a Feminist Life, and her idea of the feminist killjoy. I mean, it's really hard to do what we want to do in knowledge institutions. We also should not forget that, that that's part of the battle in the classroom, in scholarship, and in our administrations. And that's true, if not more true, of US, French, British, German context as it is of Lebanese, Iranian, Egyptian, or Moroccan context. So those are my talchis. <laughs> I think I wanted to talk about scholarship and production of scholarship and just address some of the concerns that I have, um, in part because of the activities I've been involved in the last few years with Mesa and Ijmis. Um, they're, they're pretty practical concerns. Um, the first is uh, just a reflection that as Ijmis editor, I thought, wow, this, you know, this is great. We can, I can now open up Ijmis and turn it into a gender journal um, <laughs> with yours. <laughs> but, we talked about this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I was, I was really quite surprised about the, um, 
the low number of submissions that we got. So that, that was, throughout my tenure as editor, the five years of great concern, that there wasn't, that, um, that um, we just weren't getting that many articles. And I, I think the sort of quantity, this it gets at the issue of the quantity of production of scholarship in gender. And I know from my field in history, um, there's, it, it, um, there's been a, uh, a bit of a turning away from uh, feminist, gender, women's history, whatever one calls it. And I think this gets back to what you were saying, that we have a younger generation that sort of says, I'm not feminist. You know, you've, you, we've, we've done all the work, we've won these battles, and so on. Um, and, and obviously, um, we haven't. I mean, it's, it's quite clear globally. Um, so that was just the first thing that I wanted to mention, and, and actually encourage the young scholars in the room to continue to produce this very important body of knowledge. And the second concern I had is about readership and who's reading the, the knowledge that's produced, um, and is this knowledge that's being produced around gender uh, and feminism and so on being ghettoized? Um, are we reaching the audiences that we want to reach? Are we speaking across generations, um, both up and down? Are we speaking across um, all sorts of boundaries? And, and, and are um, men reading feminist works? Um, and, and I would have to say, for some reason, and I have one of my graduate students here, I have a, a number of male graduate students, and I've, uh, they've become uh, so used to my refrain of bringing gender into all issues, but this is something that we need to do over and over again, and we need to realize that we, I guess it's just this notion of who, questioning ourselves who we're writing for and making sure that our conversation is, uh, reinforces this idea that feminism is not just about women mm -hmm. um, and, that, um, and that gender is, uh, is complicated and we need to um, keep that conversation expanded. Um, a, a further concern that I had, and again, I'm getting at a, a practical level here, is um, as a field that produces, or as a, as a collective of scholars that produces knowledge, who, are re, who is being rewarded, um, and how are we rewarding people? And one of the things that I um, observed as Mesa president that, was that Mesa had five awards uh, for scholarship. Um, it's like for scholarship and uh, book prize and so on. They were all named after men. And very uh, eminent male scholars, um, but just to push for what actually took me two years, to push for um, prizes that would be named after some of the great women scholars in the field. So we actually were able to launch a Fatima Mernissi Prize and a Nikki Caddy Prize. Um, but it wasn't uh, because of the resistance of, uh, or sort of institutional resistance, it wasn't necessarily easy. But, but this, the, the, I think this is an important point that we can't just produce scholarship, we need to circulate the scholarship and we need to celebrate the scholarship um, so, that, so that the scholars and younger scholars and so on you know, realize that, uh, that it gets recognition. And I guess the final concern, my concerns could go on, but uh, I like to not just raise concerns, but the follow, uh, final observation I would have is just uh, a concern about getting the scholarship outside of the academy. And this, I think, gets back to your point about the kinds of um, um, discourses we use for the theories or making the language and so on um, such, that the, such that we can have conversations between um, academics and activists and we think about how we bridge what sometimes are divides um, and how we just keep communication open and how we also realize that many academics are also activists and that this, this may be a kind of false binary, but it's something to keep in mind in thinking about scholarship. Can I just add one point to that academic activist? Yes. So one thing that we've done at JMU's is introduce a section called third space. <clears throat> Because there really are rules for the article, you know, the academic article, even when you're being interdisciplinary and legible in the way that you write and strong evidence and things like that, um, they, it actually does require strong, there's a strong threshold for evidence in every discipline and interdiscipline, including feminist studies. Um, but third space has been amazing. Uh, this is the third, uh, in 2018, in March, we begin the fourth year of it, because of this ability, uh, this opening for activists and filmmakers and uh, to write things from 500 words to 2,000 words, 2,500 words. So I think that's one way we are trying to bridge the divide between 
like academics and activists. And some people don't, they have BAs and some people have MAs. That's the other thing is there just isn't, but it's, again, it's theoretical and analytical. That is expected, but it's just not this, you know, and that's one way we've tried to deal with it because I think it's a real problem. Uh, uh, to answer this question, again, you know, let us precise what is theory, you know, and can we uh, separate uh, theory from uh, experience? Uh, because we always talk about uh, feminism, feminist theory and, 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 and practice. So both cannot be separated. It means that theory, it is the, uh, as you know, Francis put it, it's the condensation of, you know, uh, an experience. So by definition, it is context specific. It is context specific. It means that we cannot really work to import theoretical frames and apply it on our situation to explain it. It doesn't work like that. So it is embedded in practice. So why I'm saying this? Because it is important to ask theoretical uh, frameworks for who. And for who it means to who we are writing about theories and practice in our region. Are we uh, writing to ourselves to understand our realities, different realities, or we are writing to be part of uh, a global intellectual, you know, community, because this is also exists in our region. And maybe this is one of the reasons that we cannot really accumulate locally generated knowledge that explain and help to change our, our, our realities. So I start by that. So this is to say, in this respect, that accessibility is very important. I'm not referring to you, Francis. No? <laughs> <laughs> accessibility, the accessibility, the, the, the easy understand language, it's very important because otherwise it will end up by talking among ourselves, few groups of people. So accessibility, is vital in changing our situation, as I uh, put it in the first, you know, uh, introductory uh, note. So talking about the, uh, uh, theoretical frameworks, we witness the uh, passing by and the existence, still some of them exist, about, you know, Orientalism as a theoretical framework to understand the Orient, and of course the work of Edward Said was crucial in dismantling this uh, theoretical uh, framing for the region and its people that put religion and culture as the uh, you know source of attention and the reason why we are different and cannot be uh, essentially uh, able to, to change. Another one, uh, of course, Orientalism was uh, given a shot, you know, to revive to revive it again after 9-11. Uh, so it is not really disappearing. We have uh, another theoretical framing uh, based on uh, the, uh, the modern traditional or moder modernization theory. And it was uh, very everywhere in, in the sociology, anthropology, uh, by uh, men and women uh, outside in the West and also uh, in our region. We can just read Halim Barakat and uh, Hisham Sharabi. Uh, and we have the uh, theoretical framing of, you know, uh, development. And uh, I can add to this the instrumentalization of, uh, you know, concepts like uh, mainstreaming gender and uh, the development uh, cycles. Uh, we can uh, talk, and it, of course it, it exists, and it is practiced widely, 
and of course, in this respect, we see what Huda referred to, uh, to in this morning about the uh, internationalization, or we can talk about it, the universalization of development uh, as a as theoretical uh, uh, frame, development theory and practice uh, to understand the third world and you know women in this uh, area. We have another uh, theoretical framework uh, pertaining to women's rights, uh, you know, as uh, human uh, rights, and uh, you know this approach was used. Uh, and still used, it, it, it was used and still it's still you, <laughs> we are still using it, uh, that generated lots of debates about, you know, uh, uh, about what, what sort of, uh, of rights we, we have uh, and, uh, uh, you know, can we uh, really uh, understand our reality uh, focusing on uh, the, 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 the right deficiency we have in our uh, regions. So, uh, so I just want to uh, highlight some points about uh, this uh, later approach because it is, uh, in a way, important to, uh, to, to, you know, to examine uh, why, why this uh, framing of our uh, situation is gaining uh, uh, wide popularity because, of course, it is uh, very defined, very easy to use. It, you know, it could be a rallying cry for lots of uh, activism uh, around it. It puts the state as, you know, uh, <clears throat> as a power to claim rights uh, uh, from, but. Many uh, debates emerged, you know, to criticize, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, this approach, uh, seeing it as uh, the state that we might claim, you know, claim it for our rights, might be the, the main violators of our rights. And I think Aisha this morning gave a wonderful example about, you know, uh, the activism around the, the change of law concerning abortion. Because when we, we took the, the issue to the state, we saw that the state, or the, between quotation of course, put uh, humiliating and uh, terrible conditions, conditions on women, you know, to help uh, this woman uh, abort her, her, her baby. I mean, she, she, the, the state helped in a way, but it, it it tripped her dignity as as a human uh, as a human being. So, uh, targeting the state by the, the rights approach uh, might be sometimes a waste of resources and a waste of, of time. And uh, maybe we can use better, uh, you know, how to uh, rally our own uh, uh, our own how to rally to um, increase our power to effectuate uh, a tangible uh, change. Uh, also rights, uh, uh, you know, women's rights as human rights approach led to uh, the emergence of different forms of organization and I will not bore you with the, with the talk on the enjoyization again and uh, Etc. So when we talk about uh, rights approach, it is very important to uh, to note when we put the rights agenda, we are talking about whose right and what rights and why this particular right now and not anything. Uh, that's why my question this morning: Why abortion? Why not you know sex education, for example? you know, or, or raising awareness about, you know, uh, sexuality and sexual life uh, at all ages, not only, you know. So it means that the debates that this approach generated, uh, it, it was exactly about how we see our rights, how we see our rights and how we can interlink, you know, our uh, struggle for these rights with other groups the rights also are violated. 
And this is exactly what I mean by building our power through, you know, uh, coalition building and negotiations and uh, see the differences between our interests and our needs in general in order to uh, come up with a, a shared uh, agenda in a particular time uh, in, 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 in history because we can come together to fight or to claim this particular issue and after some other time we uh, go you know, in different directions and in different uh, or claiming different uh, interests. So uh, I, I stop here. <laughs> so one thing maybe I want to flag um, is the the two related questions of the common accusation of feminism being a Western, um, you know, a Western import. This is something that's been um, raised in academia, in scholarship, but also among activists. So this question of the origins um, of feminist thought and of feminist practice. Um, and the relationship of this to the, the you know, the broader field of post-colonial studies and specifically how it shaped the field of gender and Middle East studies. What did we take from post-colonial theory? Um, where did it limit us perhaps? Where was it productive in the sorts of questions that we were asking? Um, because it's, um, it's true that, that the specter of post-colonial theory looms large when we talk about um, gender in the region, particularly because, as you've mentioned, Beth, when we think about the audience, the readership, if the scholarship on gender produced in the region is for a foreign audience, how does that limit the terms of the debate and the kinds of questions we are asking? Um, so maybe, can you reflect a little bit on that? Um. So I actually find that most of the scholarship produced in the region has, is, act, is produced by funding organizations and that even it's pretty, um, uh, it ends up being sort of around particular questions and it's hard because I've worked with authors who are, you know, emerging feminist sexuality scholars, and I have to do a lot of work to actually reframe them from, they've, they're already, they're, there's a script that they're essentially following, so a lot of what we get is like human rights, or it's, it's following some kind of invisible, uh, policy kind of plan. And just to go deeper, uh, you know, what you were saying about uh, feminist, uh, feminism as a Western import, feminism, feminist thought, I mean, this is where I think thinking historically is very important. Uh, to do, to think, right, and to then put your thinking in writing, that is a luxury. And I mean, everyone is thinking, but to actually translate your thinking beyond the people that you know to someone else, that's, that's a luxury. That's a, that's a luxury of many kinds. It's a gendered luxury. It's a class luxury. It's racialized. And, um, and it's not been that long that women well, first of all, poor people, enslaved people, you know, they don't get to do that either. But it's not been a long time that women generally are, you know, have had that space to uh, write and think. I heard, you know, we heard Huda and I was, I heard the tail end of your panel and we have examples of Arab women, for example, that have been doing that in the 19th century. And, and we also have religious scholars that some women really religious scholars that have had the opportunity to write their thoughts. But I think it's important not to, um, I don't know, and then like feminism, if, if I just don't think of feminism, I don't know, I grew up in a working class family where I, I didn't have any academic relatives or I feel like I learned my feminism in my in my spaces in in my in my family spaces uh, through analysis so I don't I think I'm sorry don't quote me well I won't use my usual bad language but I think it's a problem to assume that um, that feminism is somehow a Western thing, a kind of analysis of inequality. That's so clearly not true that I don't understand why I'd have to explain that to somebody. Now, 
the question of publishing and writing, that, you know, to, that also is like that. But then, because this links to some of my comments about teaching and thinking. So translation, like, for example, when I teach, and I, I raise this sometimes, so I'll teach, I, I'll I teach a wonderful freshman seminar on gender and sexuality in the Middle East. And I will teach things in translation or originally written in English on like Saudi Arabia, you know, literature and ethnography and history, and there's a unit there. And, uh, but why, I mean, I think we need to ask ourselves why, for example, uh, a Palestinian or uh, you know, a Moroccan doesn't go to Chicago and do an ethnography, or doesn't go to New York and do an archival project on something related to New York, or Chicago, or LA, or slavery. Think about that. That's what tells you that I'm in the heart, of, we're all in the heart of a colonial project. Why is it that I'm teaching this wonderful class at Duke or at Oberlin, but in the Hejaz, or you know what I mean, are they teaching a class like that on, right, on these questions in the West, in the United States, in North America, and what would, that's not happening, okay, and, but, but there's a piece of it which is also producing that knowledge, and that's not happening either, and so, so I'm, I'm against the idea of a university as simply teaching about the national setting and simply teaching the local problems because I, that, why should it be the privilege of empires to teach about, to know and teach everything and then we're all stuck having to just produce our local. We can do, we can do it the other way. And I guess my, my other point that I had written down but I didn't develop because it's something I think about all the time, which is, you know, me and others like me, we're highly gendered and racialized together in the academy and that's a long part of teaching in the Western Academy when you don't fit into, and I'm very privileged, at, you know, I recognize that. But I think that that's a very important thing in classrooms and, um, and in uh, every setting. And the higher you get, the more subtle it gets, but it's no less powerful. Uh, thanks. Here, you want this? Okay, I'll take this one. Okay. okay. Yeah, so to turn to some of the questions around uh, pedago pedagogy, um, I, I think the, the sort of challenges that one faces um, or the issues one faces, they obviously depend on what levels one is teaching and uh, for whom one is preparing materials. Um, I, I, I've, uh, I think that there are a couple of um, issues that come out, I think, with, with teaching and teaching materials, um, but there are some success stories, as, as you asked us to think about. Um, but one of the things that I've observed with scholars going out into the field, and this is again, um, and these could be scholars coming from the Middle East, coming to study in the, in the States or in New York, and then going back to the Middle East, maybe to a different country, but um, doing field work uh, in, in this area. Um, and at least what I've observed in some programs in, um, in, in our university is that the scholars are not necessarily prepared, they're prepared to go out into the field and do work, but they're not prepared, and they may even be going out to do gender work, they may not be, but they're not pre being prepared now to think about their own gender and some of the, some of the problems or, or questions they may have. It's as if their own gender as scholars is erased. Um, and I just, I, I, I've, I've heard from students that this is um, an issue and something of concern that, that we should be thinking about, so it's not as if when we're producing knowledge about feminism, we're just these neutral bodies producing knowledge about feminism, but we're gendered um, as well. And I think that's important because it obviously, um, it impacts the research, it becomes part of the research story. Um, and it, this, is, this is quite clear. The, the, in, in thinking about the, um, the, sort of the sort of success stories or the, the, the contributions, I think that, um, the production of knowledge around women and gender studies in the Middle East has made is, I mean, already I think from, from the beginning we were thinking about gender, class, and race. We didn't have necessarily use the term intersectionality, but um, I, I think that's something that, that's come a long way and that ha does, definitely does com contribute to wider uh, conversations. Um, yeah, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, 
when I talked about theoretical frames, you know, and, and how these uh, theoretical frames are based on experiences, experiences are not limited to a national border or local uh, set. I mean, it is basically about, uh, you know, uh, base, basing our work on uh, ethnography and diversified uh, sets of, uh, of methodology uh, to understand the, the context or the uh, experiences we are examining. And when I talked about the theoretical frame, it's, it's basically not to, uh, not to uh, cage ourselves in already existing theoretical frames, but it's basically how to be driven by what we are experiencing and how to think out of the box, out the, of the box of the theoretical framing. This is exactly what I mean. So the, it's very important, you know, in the pedagogy to, uh, you know, to, to give some sort of dialogic, dialogic, you know, uh, dialogic processes of how, what we see, how it, it relates to the existing theoretical frames and how can we change it. So it is always a, a process of building critical knowledge. Yeah, yeah. this is um, just another thing to note that when you raise the issue of um, um, feminism being considered a Western import. It's, 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 it's just so ironic. I mean, that, that claim has been made for a, over 100 years. And so it, it, there is a sense with pedagogy that we keep on having to fight the same, the, the same sort of tropes about, um, about feminism as an import or stereotypes about women and gender and so on. Um, it, the, the context is obviously very different if one is teaching here or in the region or one is teaching in the U.S. or when it's teaching to, to ASPR mm. students and so on. But it, it seems like that, that, that's a kind of um, uh, um, battle that, that's just ongoing. Uh, that is, that's never sort of won, but it's just work that we, we constantly have to do. So, I mean, uh, Beth and Francis, you've, you're teaching in the U.S. Um, Islah, you've taught, um, um, you've been teaching in Birzeit. Uh, you've also uh, recently been um, establishing or help establish a program in Qatar, right? In, in gender and women's studies. No, I failed miserably. You, you, fa uh, you and, and, so, and so the question is, what, what are your, you know, with your different locations, um, what are the challenges of teaching um, about gender in the region, in your classrooms in the U.S.? And, and, and in, the, in the region, but also some maybe institutional challenges in experiences of building gender studies programs as well. So I have a lot of thoughts on that um, that I haven't written down, but, um, but I would say one thing that I learned over time is that in a space like gender and sexuality studies or feminist studies, you can often fall into the service category for the university. So people are taking a lot of course, they're taking the courses but not necessarily majoring. And there's a kind of metrics or math that has to do with how many faculty lines you get and how much money your department gets that um, I've seen it at multiple uh, institutions. And so, so that's, I think, a danger. And one way that some spaces uh, deal with it, and that's true at Duke, the way they deal with it, is um, there's a very, very strong component of research and events, meaning that, so, okay, so yes, um, here we're offering all these classes, they're being taken by increasingly professionalizing students in a situation where school costs more and more. I mean, you already have the usual things where parents want you to get a job, they want you to have health insurance, and, and so, you know, they want you to have certain things, and, but school also costs more, so students are, are you're battling that kind of professionalization. So I think that's um, one very important 
important thing. And then the other piece is how um, it's very, um, okay. So the way I think of it is interdisciplinarity can also be just a capitalist, uh, neoliberal downsizing form of labor. Mm -hmm. So so you're a jack of all trades. You'll teach in media studies and you'll teach in gender studies and you can be in history and you can, um, so in the end, I mean, it's it's intellectually uh, rewarding and, uh, and pedagogically rewarding, but it's interesting to think about how to manage the labor uh, questions and then how that translates in terms of promotion and money for research and things like that. So I would say those are, you know, have nothing, not necessarily to do with the Middle East. I would say my experience in Palestine really early in women's studies in Palestine is the shocking number of men that take gender classes. You know, you're, this whole East-West thing, this is, this is just a huge problem in the US. You do not have cisgendered men who are, uh, you know, like you, you'll, ha you'll have queer, you know, non-normative sexual men, but the, the classes are dominated by, by women, and that's not true. In, in the region, that's not true in the same way. There is a serious engagement with sexuality and gender, in my opinion, among, I, I can't speak for AUB. Um, so that's the other, you know, that's the other, so that becomes a ghetto, mm. and it's not a spoken kind of ghetto, but there's just a way in which when, uh, yeah, anyway. Um, oh, I guess you'll use that. Just, um, so I teach graduate students at the CUNY Graduate Center, but I teach undergraduates at uh, City College, which is um, in the middle of Harlem. Uh, and we, we, we have a large number of Latinos um, and first and second generation heritage students from the Arab region. So it, I think it's, it's important when you're thinking about teaching and teaching in American universities to think about the range of universities that, we're, that there are. So, mm -hmm. I mean, we commonly hear, and we saw this morning, um, about the, the Big Ten or the Big 12 or eight or however many Ivies there are. Um, but those are, you know, sort of, it's not your, it's not most of your universities. I mean, I'm at, I'm at a public university that's terribly underfunded. Um, there's, you know, there's, uh, we, we haven't had uh, electricity go off, but we've, we've certainly had a uh, lack of a lot of uh, utilities and, and other, I mean, issues. So, so, so the students and teaching the students is, is it, um, it's challenging and rewarding, but it's also some of these students who are coming from the region bring with them a lot of stories that are just so, um, so interesting to share with the classmates and so on. So it's a real collective experience of learning about the region um, together. So I think it's always important to, to in these east-west mm -hmm. dichotomies sure and divides and so on, to just remember these very real um, differences within the United States, uh, and these differences that are just um, really increasing uh, rapidly um, these days, particularly these days. Thank you. Uh, if we go back to the, um, the starting point that, you know, um, theory, it is about uh, social, social change and dismantling the structure of oppression, it means that context will play a major role in that. In the sense that when, when we work in the knowledge production, uh, the question is in knowledge for who and for what. So, uh, Yes, my experience in Palestine is completely different than in Qatar. For example, in Palestine, we were confronted by the enlightened uh, colonial power that uh, Israeli uh, uh, colonial uh, structure opened up the um, Israeli labor market for women. Uh, this dismantled patriarchy. It liberated uh, women in Palestine. Uh, look at the gay, you know, and L LGBT movement. They cannot really uh, benefit or exercise their rights in their um, traditional backward, violent uh, context, uh, and they they have to move to 
uh, Israel, you know, to uh, uh, to bend or to exercise this basic human uh, right. And we we were confronted at the very beginning by by these issues. How can we dismantle the colonial knowledge, you know, uh, about us? But we were also confronted by something else about the, the quick, we call them the quick meal experts coming for two weeks and writing a report of 60 or 70 pages. The first paragraph in, in it is uh, culture and traditions uh, in the Palestinian society and you know the rest. So we were confronted by this. And we had to discuss, uh, and, and when I say that we had to discuss, it means that building uh, 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 women's studies or gender study and gender studies program, it needs lots of deliberation, lots of discussion, lots of strategizing, because parallel, equic uh, um, yeah, equally parallel, uh, you know, process is how to build the legitimacy of the program. This is not required for other disciplines, you know, in social science, but in gender and women's studies, it is very important. And why I'm saying this important? Because in our region, it could be very dangerous. And here I have, of course, you know, in, in mind the case of uh, Raufa Hassan in Yemen, that she was forced to close down the gender studies program in Sana'a University. And she was so stressed by, you know, I mean mob, they organized, uh, they, they, they organized, I mean the, 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 fund, the, the Salafi groups organized a demonstration that attacked the university. And of course, uh, you know, sadly enough, she developed breast cancer and she passed away after that. She was so uh, stressed. So it could be very dangerous in this sense. And the same thing happened in the Jordanian University with our, you know, Rula Qawas, our dear friend, she also passed away and developed, you know. <laughs> so it could be very dangerous. This will take me to uh, Qatar. I, uh, as I put in my teaching philosophy and etc., that I am so keen to uh, start a women's studies pro uh, program in, for the minor uh, uh, undergraduate studies. So uh, two weeks after my arrival, I wrote a beautiful proposal and what are the courses will be taught and how and why and all the rationale, you know, that uh, I put. And I gave it to the head of the department I waited one week to be no reaction of whatsoever. I wrote him uh, um, an email, no reaction. So I went to the dean. Uh, she said that it has to pass by the, the head of the department. I started to lobby, you know, as all Palestinians know how to lobby. So I started to lobby around, you know, and a department of 35 people, I found three people in on my side. So. It, it was impossible to think about it. What were the excuses? What were the reasons? Uh, it doesn't work here. It's not needed. You know, it is not needed. So, I managed to introduce some gender component in the irregular, uh, you know, courses, and uh, there are some some issues. You cannot teach it without a legitimizing lubricant factor like the religion say so, hmm. you know. So it has to be framed sometimes, not everything, it has to be framed sometimes with the religious, the religion legitimacy. Because it is a Wahhabi state in the constitution, hmm. you know. So it is, it was very important, you know, not to solicit resistance, you know, and it was so important to, uh, to build gradually the trust of the students, you know, and, uh, and the legitimacy of what are you saying, and using different m m ways and means, uh, you know, to do that. And I was involved in a task force that led to the establishment of a master's program in Hamad bin Khalifa University, 
master's program, and it will be taught in English, you know. For a very limited number of students, we talk about six, seven students, you know, per semester. And the, the, ti the, 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 the title of the program that women's studies in the Arab world, or, or Arab women's studies. And when the proposal went through that administrative channel, hmm, they uh, added development, uh, they added uh, Arab women uh, uh, development uh, and societal issues. Yeah, a societal issues. And this is for a very limited number of people and in English. Again, when uh, I finished my course, it was uh, on uh, gender and law. It was called like this. And uh, to celebrate the end of the, the courses, we decided th this, uh, no, it was not about uh, gender and law. It was about uh, the capstone uh, course. So uh, some of the students did very good research paper on uh, gender issues. So we decided to publish the outcome you know, of the papers in uh, uh, the newspaper, one page in the newspaper of uh, mainstream newspaper to celebrate the Women's Day. So the title was uh, No Qatarization Without Gender, you know. So they uh, removed the, uh, no, no Qatarization without uh, uh, um, no al-ijtima'i, between, uh, you know, uh, parentheses, uh, gender. So they, uh, of course, they uh, erased gender and put it no al because no one understands what does it mean, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but gender is a demonized term. It is a demonized term, and you cannot really uh, use it. So, you know, in order to effectuate a change in, in the society where you practice the education in it, you have to navigate a very, very sensitive mm. context. Um, thank you, all of you. I feel like, um, based on your final uh, uh, comments, Slah, because we started by sort of expanding the scope of what a feminist lens can do, right? Move beyond women, but somehow we're back into, you know, just the mere mention of women's studies um, as, a, as a provocation, right? So it makes us wonder also about the importance of doing this, you know, in parallel, this expansion of the scope of, of feminist analysis while also returning or, or insisting on, you know, focusing on women's experiences and the particularities. The different experiences. Exactly, in their differences, in their intersectionalities, uh, recasting a new light on our histories to take into account, um, you know, political, economic experiences through a gender lens, paying particular attention to the neglected histories and lives of women. Um, and on this note, I would like to open this up to, to questions from the audience. Um, if you have questions about what's been discussed or other questions, uh, please feel free to do so uh, now. No, it's not working. Thank you very much. This was, yeah, very interesting. Can you hear me? Yes. So I have a question about pedagogy. Actually, I have two questions. As you said, Francis, half of my classes in Morocco are men. So I end up teaching masculinities as much as I teach gender studies. And the words gender studies or women's studies is not a problem at my university. But dare I say we should actually call that a course in masculinity studies then we have a problem because we all know what men are. When I find in my classes, that's a really big question mark. The men understand what the goals of 
uh, women's rights is, but they no longer understand where they fit in into this changed society. So I have a lot of questions about how to adequately incorporate masculinity studies in um, my classes, and if you have some suggestions on that. The other uh, um, question I have is, I find that I'm beginning to lose my student if I, students if I use that old format, I'm standing there, I'm giving classes, giving lectures, I assign you reading, and then we discuss this. So I've started uh, to send the students out into the communities. And I live in a part of the world, or in a part of Morocco, where there's much illiteracy. So I ask the students to work with rural women's associations, semi-literate or Ill illiterate women's associations. Or when we do migration, I send them out and work with refugee populations, which are mostly African south of the Sahara. And then I run into a lot of institutional problems that what are you sending our wonderful elite students out into these rural neighborhoods into these sturdy refugee camps, that's not our mission as educators. So if you have any of you some brilliant ideas <laughs> how to convince administrations, if we understand feminism of breaking down discrimination on all levels or oppression on all levels, we can only do that if our students experience what life is like on that oppressed Absolutely. side yeah. or discriminated side. But the administration wants them to only learn this from textbooks, not by actually going out into those communities. So, so I, any I, suggestions you might have, I'd be very grateful for. Can I quick address? Yes. Um, so I think that with the administration, I mean, I think you have to ask yourself why. And, um, and I think you can easily come up with the answers of why they don't want to do that. So I, I mean, it goes back to my earlier comment about uh, universities are, are, are a significant place. You know, they're not neutral of any of these battles. And of course, class, you know, and class status matters. Now, in my, um, I introduced a global men and masculinities class at Duke which I was shocked, I mean, I, I did it three years ago, I think, that, no, there, that there wasn't one. Um, so uh, one thing, I think the going out is very important, and I mean, I can share my syllabus with anybody who emails me, and every syllabus itself, it's going to have to emerge from its setting, but one thing that was very effective was uh, kind of oral histories. So I had every student, not all of whom are men, go and uh, do, like I trained them in uh, oral history and interviewing and uh, ethics and all that. And uh, we created a protocol and a short one of five questions, not very long. And they had to find three male identified people uh, over a 30 year span, no, young, no <coughs> children. And they, so they each produced a, you know, and then they wrote about, and we shared all along. That is fascinating, especially if you structure the project um, over us a, a term and you break the class so that after everybody's done interview one, you actually have a class session where people are talking. I, it was, I could do this full time. Do you know what I mean? If I had a team of researchers and because the things that were coming out and some of the students are immigrants and African Americans, it also is a class in the United States that attracted uh, students of color and men uh, into those into that class. So that's uh, yeah, I, 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 I think it's fascinating. And the way you teach it, by the way, so I taught a unit on Trump. You know, so Trump had just been elected. This is what I mean about it's all about context. So how could I teach a unit on Trump with no like real academic scholarship? Well, actually, if you think historically, you know, I taught a couple of chapters on white men in the KKK in Georgia in the 1920s. I taught a, a, an article on what trans men think about masculinity, you know, just like a, a non-academic article. So I kind of mixed it up in terms of places and spaces, and I, I taught a unit on Trump, 
And so I think that kind of way of taking a question and then thinking for your class and your context how you might be able to address that question. And you wouldn't go traditionally, right? That was fascinating. May I add something? Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, you, the administration doesn't approve this because, you know, knowledge is power. And we have, of course, you know, hierarchies in, in knowledge to know about who and why. So if I were you, I will take my students to visit the minister of something. It's a man or a woman in a, a very, you know, distinguished power position. And I will invite the administrator. He would love or she would love to meet with the minister. So this will be just a legitimizing, you know, process to, to get the acceptance that they get out of the campus. And then I will do what I want. <laughs> You're good. You're very good. <laughs> Can I do? Yes, please. Uh, I sorry. And I feel like sorry. we're yeah. I, very hungry and tired. Yeah. So I just want to quickly uh, yes, uh, talk about a very small experience want to call it. I, together with a colleague from uh, Dominican University in California, did in teaching gender, gender, not feminism, masculinity, and, uh, uh, and, and gender, and women femin femin feminism. Uh, what we did, I was uh, teaching this course at Al-Quds University, and uh, I had the majority of uh, males in, in the class. She had a minor, a few uh, males, and um, most of uh, women, females. What we did is that each in her campus requested that the class write the perception of masculinity and femininity in the other society. Like in Dominican about us and us about them and then we exchanged um, the perceptions Very and nice. we mm -hmm. did a brainstorming discussion about what the other things mm -hmm. and this was very challenging and very enriching both ways. Mm -hmm. The feedback we received, she received there, and I received in, in Palestine, was amazing. Yes. So this is one way of possibly introducing mm -hmm. this and also um, dismantling the east-west uh, right. boundaries as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Fascinating. So, yeah. Any final comments? Or? Oh, okay. the question. No. Yes, please. She'll be the last person. Thank you. I'm hungry yeah, too. Okay. We'll, we'll but um, so I was just, um, of course, I recognize the phenomenon of uh, some younger generation saying, oh, okay, why do we need feminism? And there's something supposedly called post feminism. I don't get it, but there's something like that. Um, but I have to say that in my experience, in my perception, it's quite the opposite, whether it's in the UK or also, I mean, the countries, I guess, that I've known best, Egypt or Iraq or even Turkey, um, Lebanon, where, um, I, I mean, when I started doing research 20 years ago, many of the feminists I talked to that I thought were feminist, you know, would not want to be called feminists. And the main thing was, well, we do not want to be associated with this Western imported um, concept. While I find that the younger generation doesn't seem to carry that same burden and uh, complex, but is much more aware or sort of confident of its own histories of struggle and it's not so much caught into this, oh, because it's supposedly, and I very much agree with Francis, you know, it's, why should it be a Western thing? So anyway, I think that, and I feel the same in certain Western contexts, certainly the UK, where all of a sudden you have thousands and thousands of young women who self-identify as feminists, which is very different from previous generations. So I think it's more complex than, I mean, I, I think both might be happening. Um, and I just wanted to pick up on one point, Isla, because it's, I mean, sometimes the stories we tell about certain events to illustrate something, I think it's really problematic. So I pick it up because often what happens to me, I go to the States, I speak about Iraq, and people mention precisely what you 
told about Bremer and the Constitution as an example of colonial feminism. When I go to the States, it's being used as a story, as an example to illustrate how uh, wonderful the US was in actually liberating women and giving them the quota. You now used it as an example for colonial feminism. And I think it's really problematic because what happened was that Iraqi feminists managed to get the quota despite the objection of Bremer. And I don't think it was colonial feminism. I mean, it was actually women you know, resisting that. Okay, we can have a discussion whether it was reformist in terms of, you know, sort of hudas, uh, but I don't think it's an illustration of colonial feminism. Bremer didn't want it. He looked at them and he said, we don't do quotas. Uh, I just have a very quick question for uh, Professor Chad. Um, you've been speaking about um, making knowledge more accessible, right? Um, okay, could you raise your voice? You've been speaking about making knowledge more accessible. Um, so my question would be, especially in the Palestinian context, how can uh, feminist knowledge production contribute to struggles for decolonization, specifically like uh, struggles against displacement from movements on the ground? Um, so how can you... Um, interact much more with, with, with movements on the ground and share the knowledge that is produced outside the universities? Mm. Uh, I, I didn't hear all, you know, your, your question may be very, not very well. Uh, but let me start by an, uh, a, a fact that w we have been working a lot with the Ministry of Women's Affairs and um, Women's, uh, women's affairs, it's supposed to be the, the national machinery for mainstreaming gender. We didn't talk about this, you know, because this is very important to il illustrate about the, how, how, how the, the, the issue of, uh, you know, dismantling the, the existing so social order turned into technicalities. I mean, the gender mainstreaming, it, ha it has lots of technicalities you know, uh, how to set gender units, uh, the bylaws, uh, etc. And they all, you know, the, when they write their reports, <coughs> we, we achieved, you know, the, the establishment of 20 gender units. Yes, what, what are the resources you have, Mafish? You know, I mean, <laughs> they are very disempowered by, by the so-called state, state structure itself. And they, they just put women uh, in these units because they were uh, old militant and, you know, they don't find job for them, so they just put them in this women think in every ministry. Um, so, so when we, uh, we, we, we try to do something with them, I cannot remember exactly what is it, they did not want to mention occupation. E occupation is not the cause of our, you know, uh, situation. Uh, and don't, don't uh, use occupation as a hanger on which you want to, to, to put, uh, to suspend everything. And that was very shocking, you know, for, 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 for us. Uh, especially these women, when they leave the meeting with us and try to get out of the city of Ramallah, they will immediately be confronted with the Israeli uh, checkpoint that will, uh, uh, you know, uh, not allow them to go and communicate with other women in Nablus or Hebron or everywhere. So... It was so important to do this connectedness, you know, the intersectionality, because the, 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 the discourse uh, generated by the universal frames of, of right, you know, assumed that there is a state and you have to claim your rights from it. But what about if you are occupied? What about if you don't have really a state? What can we do? Nothing. You do the same thing again. You know, I mean, how to lobby, how, I, and uh, lots of, uh, lots and lots of workshops about consciousness raising and rights, you know, uh, how to lobby the institutions, the legal institutions, the executive, etc., about how to claim uh, your rights. It was all, you know, like, uh, 
uh, as if we are living in a la la land. It, it is not real. You know, it is not real. So it, it took us uh, lots of debates and lots of fights and lots of, you know, other things. Still, at least in the documents, now you see the, the Israeli occupation that it doesn't allow, you know, women's empowerment, whether in the uh, labor force, whether in, you know, when it comes to the, uh, when I compare, for example, the first uh, uh, national survey on violence, you know, Francis, uh, no uh, political violence, all domestic violence. How domestic violence is connected to other things, you know, how to study it in connectedness with other, you know, it was not there. So the last one, it was a bit better because also we tried to work with the, uh, the Palestinian Bureau of Statistics and we, you know, we did some success, not, not very, but, you know, I mean, it is always, you know, a battle, a battle. Uh, about uh, how to the hegemony that comes sometimes with universal framing, you know, it is very powerful. It is very powerful because it is supported by lots of money, you know, that it, it ends up by this disconnectedness. And I think our colleague here, they were mentioned something this morning about why why women's movement or feminist movement in Lebanon do not see the violations of the, you know, the non-Lebanese resident rights. Because we are separating, we are, you know, in, uh, in a very apolitical confinement that we see rights as us, you know, only uh, us as a group of, I don't know, academic women or us as, you know, battered women or us. I mean, we don't do the, the, the connection. So we can get some reform from a very sectarian political regime because he knows that this, you know, uh, this uh, gains is not going to threaten the, 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 the continuation and the existence of the regime. And this is the, the point I think, Nadia, this morning raised. What is the red line for us as feminists in dealing with this? This is the red line. When I realize that I am beautifying an ugly structure, I have to exit. That's it. So I, I just want to quick. Um, uh, you know, build uh, uh, two things. One is, I think there's a Palestinian women's radio station now. I Things change so fast that I don't know, but it was around in the summer, and, uh, and that's been kind of amazing. But I wanted to uh, raise, uh, I, you probably know this, but, and I'm not going to say, I actually would prefer if we didn't leave this event online, by the way. Um, so yes. it's, yeah, is it being live streamed? I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm okay, not sure. okay, good. Yeah, so I would, I don't want this out, but um, so, uh, but I'm still going to be uh, careful. The, uh, there's a very large Palestinian women's organization that's funded by multiple, the Norwegians and the Americans and the UN and this and this and this. And you know, this whole thing of, and it's, it's women and women's empowerment and blah, blah, blah. And they, they you know, one of their, uh, their main person who, uh, Slah and I know, um, you know, is, is a, has a tradition of activism. She comes into this NGO thing from a kind of uh, a leftist, activist, feminist perspective. And what, so, so, so they were trying to manage Manage grassroots that women get to decide in Nablus, da -da -da, da -da -da -da, like what to do with little little pots of money, and um, and so what happened is that a group in the northern Palestine, a local group, decided to use a little pot of money to renovate a community center, and they renamed it Dalal Morabi, mm. and they so they named it for a Palestinian fighter. And the organization was in a dilemma because they, you know, here's this thing, grassroots, you, you said empowerment, and it's only a tiny bit of money, and the community wants to name it for a hero from their community. And that produced an international crisis. 
you know, and multiple governments pulled out money, threatened to pull out money. So I mean, we're like the whole, we're at the cusp of, you know, I don't think it's only Palestine, but I'm just saying that there's no neutral space where any of us are doing these things. And um, yeah. Nadia, you are the expert in Iraq. <laughs> Just, just, Please, one, yeah. Yeah, just, just a sort of last word um, uh, in response to, to Nadia's comment, and that is and going back to the title, so maybe coming full circle. Um, I think to say feminism and crisis, I actually, I mean, I've been very inspired by the, the papers, the conversation, the stories, and so on. I mean, I don't, I think feminism is in crisis in the United States. It's just maybe emerging from it, but, <laughs> but it, it's not in crisis here. I mean, I think there's a very vibrant, very exciting, uh, very sort of lively, uh, potential and, and current practice and so on. It's just, it's very inspiring. And, and I think that feminists in the United States need to learn from, from practice here. So maybe you can export it to the United States and we'll import it. We can <laughs> organize uh, uh, the workshops feminism there. Feminism will be a, a, an import from the Middle East or whatever we call in the region. Um, thank you so much for uh, Francis, for Beth, and for Islah. So um, we're trying to catch up with our original schedule. Um, for our, all our conference participants, um, you can take a break, freshen up, uh, go to the bathroom, and then uh, let's meet downstairs in the common room for dinner, um, but also for a screening of short movies, short films. Um, huh? Uh, they're very short uh, uh, by Nazra, uh, which is a feminist, Egyptian feminist um, organization. Um, so thank you. Uh, one, one important announcement. Um, for those who have used the headsets for translation, please make sure to return them because we need to recharge them for tomorrow. A few of them are missing. Um, um, and thank you for being an attentive um, audience. And we'll see you tomorrow for uh, the second day of our conference. <laughs>